Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the cardiac cycle here. Uh, if you look at this, you can see the entire cardiac cycle. And you can see there's two interlocking rings. The outer ring represents uh, ventricular activities. The inner ring represents atrial activities. So you can see that uh, you know you can enter atrial systole followed by atrial diastole, and then back to atrial systole again. Or with the outer ring, you can enter you know ventricular systole, enter ventricular diastole, and then come back again. Now the main takeaway point you can see from the slide is that we spend a lot more time in diastole than systole. You know, the systolic phases of the atria and ventricles are much shorter than their diastolic phases. In fact, we spend two times as much time in ventricular uh, diastole than we do ventricular systole. So uh, just picking a starting point, let's start uh, with ventricular filling, which occurs during late ventricular diastole. Uh, what we find here is that the atria are filling up with blood from their venous return, right? So you have the systemic veins draining into the right atrium, pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. Now what happens is that there comes a point in time while the ventricles are relaxing, because we're in ventricular diastole here, that these AV valves open because there's more pressure in the atria than the ventricles. So then these AV valves open up and you get passive filling of the ventricles. Now this passive filling accounts for 80% of the volume of blood that fills that ventricle. Okay. Now later on, during late ventricular diastole, then we enter atrial systole. Now this correlates with the P wave on the EKG because that's the you know atrial depolarization. So the atria start to contract. So when the atrial myocardium starts to contract, it forces a residual amount of like 20% of blood that fills the ventricles to their maximal level. And the volume of blood that fills that ventricle at the end of atrial systole or the end of ventricular diastole, we call ventricular end diastolic volume. It's just the amount of blood that fills the ventricle at the end of diastole right before ventricular systole. So we find that is that the atria pump, you know, 20% of blood uh, that fills the ventricles during atrial systole. Then right after atrial systole, we enter ventricular systole. So early on in ventricular systole, while the ventricles are first starting to contract, they're going to force blood up against those AV valves, causing the AV valves to snap shut. When those AV valves close, that causes the first heart sound, that's just S1, or the lub noise. And this also begins a period of time called the isovolumetric contraction phase, when both AV valves are closed and all the semilunar valves are closed as well. So basically all the valves of the heart are closed, even though the ventricles are contracting, so we call that isovolumetric contraction phase. That occurs early in ventricular systole. Uh, later on in ventricular systole, like let's say late or mid to late ventricular systole, what, what happens then is that when the ventricles generate enough pressure to generate more pressure than the aorta and pulmonary trunk, then these semilunar valves open, which allows for blood to be ejected or forced out through the pulmonary trunk or through the aorta. We call this the ejection phase. And this will continue until we reach the end of ventricular systole, which is also the beginning of ventricular diastole. So the early phase of ventricular diastole is when the ventricles first start to relax. Now they have less pressure in each ventricle than the aorta and pulmonary trunk, so the semilunar valves swing closed because they're going to prevent backflow of blood there. And when those semilunar valves close, they close with so much force, that creates another sound, which is S2, or the dub noise. And when those semilunar valves close, we find that as that all the valves are closed, including the atrioventricular valves, and the AV valves are closed because there's still enough pressure in the ventricles to keep them closed, so that when all the valves are closed, but the ventricles are in diastole, we call that isovolumetric relaxation phase. And it's, a br it's kind of a brief period of time until like mid-ventricular diastole, then we come back to ventricular filling, where once the ventricles have relaxed enough, then uh, atrial pressure could exceed ventricular pressure. Those AV valves swing open and blood starts pooling back in the ventricles. Now these semilunar valves will stay closed until we get back to mid to late ventricular systole because there's still residual pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunk that exceeds ventricular pressure, which means that these valves will pr continue to prevent backflow of blood from the aorta and pulmonary trunk back in the ventricles until all the way towards mid to late ventricular systole. So those semilunar valves closed for uh, a good period of time here. And that actually takes us one full circle of a cardiac cycle.
Now, um, those heart sounds we talked about were just due to closing of valves. So when the AV valves close, that's the, at the beginning of systole, ventricular systole, that's S1, okay, and that's going to be uh, our lub noise and lub dub. When uh, the semilunar valves close, which is the beginning of ventricular diastole or relaxation, uh, that causes the dub noise or S2, uh, which is the second heart sound. And um, these sounds are important to know <clears throat> clinically because they should normally make a nice clean lub or dub, right, without any kind of trailing off. If these valves are failing to work properly, like if they don't close all the way or if they close and then reopen and kind of, uh, you know, wiggle around, um, this can cause heart murmurs. So heart murmurs are abnormal heart sounds, which can indicate problems with these valves. So what if, what if you had a condition where it's like, lub, 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 right? Instead of a nice clean lub, dub, what if it went lub, da 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 right? And the, the dub starts trailing off. Well, we know that dub or S2 is due to the semilunar valve. So that, then you can determine, based on that noise, there might be a problem with the semilunar valves, okay? So just something to keep in mind. Now, these sounds can be auscultated or heard um, at between the second and fifth intercostal spaces. So the intercostal spaces are the spaces between the ribs. So the second intercostal space would be the space between ribs two and three. And the fifth intercostal space would be between ribs five and six. And you can hear these valves in those specific regions. So if you find the midline here, right in the sternum, just to the right of the midline at the second intercostal space, that's the place you can hear the aortic valve. So if you place your stethoscope right there, you can hear the aortic valve in action. So you can kind of isolate that specific valve right there, which is actually pretty neat. If you place your stethoscope right here, uh, just to the left of the midline, also in the second intercostal space, that's where you can hear the pulmonary semilunar valve. And uh, it's pretty neat, you can isolate that there too. Now what's odd here is that the atrioventricular valves are heard much lower. Okay, so it's better to, to listen for the AV valves um, in the fifth intercostal space. So you can hear the tricuspid valve, or right atrioventricular valve, uh, in the fifth intercostal space, just to the right of the midline. And you can hear the, um, the left atrioventricular valve, or mitral valve, um, in the fifth intercostal space, pretty far to the left, just kind of just beneath the left nipple here. So um, I you know, would challenge you guys to, tr to try practicing this later. So uh, you, know, you need a good stethoscope to hear it well, but if you have one, you know, try it out. Why not? Um, so what this slide shows you guys is this diagram. We call it the Wigger diagram. It's just named after somebody who, who came up with this. Um, but basically what it shows are heart sounds, electrocardiographic events, as well as changes in the volume of ventricles and changes in pressure in different areas around your heart. So what's cool about this diagram is it really just ties it all together and we can correlate our electrical events with our mechanical events all in time. Not necessarily real time, but you can look at them, you know, side by side. So I always pick a starting point when I look at this diagram, and I like to start with the P wave here because we know the P wave represents atrial depolarization, which is the beginning of atrial systole. So right before the atria contracts, then you know you should expect that atrial pressure isn't changing a whole lot. But after the P wave, after atrial depolarization, you can expect then that atrial pressure should rise because the atria start to contract contract, and when they contract, they're generating more pressure here, right? Well, as atrial pressure rises, we can see that ventricular pressure also rises, right? Because blood's being forced in the ventricle, and this represents the 20% of blood that's pumped in the ventricle due to the, the contraction of atria, because the red line here indicates uh, each, um, ventricular volume. You can see that ventricular volume remains constant here until you get to atrial systole, and there's a little bit, 20%, that's pumped in to the ventricle, okay? Now the next event on the EKG then is the QRS wave, and that correlates with ventricular depolarization, which is basically the beginning of action potentials in the ventricles. So you should expect then that right after ventricular depolarization, you should see the ventricles contract, and that's what we see. So when the ventricles contract, then ventricular pressure rises, and as this ventricular pressure rises, once it gets above uh, atrial pressure, it causes the AV valve to close. Once that AV valve closes and we go down, that causes the first heart sound, which is closure of the atrioventricular valves due to contraction of the ventricles. And they're pushing, the blood's pushing up on that valve, causing the AV valve to snap shut. 
Now, this begins a phase called the isovolumetric contraction phase where all the valves are closed even though the ventricles are currently contracting. The AV valves are closed because they just closed, right? They close because blood's being pushed up on the valves and they snap shut. The semilunar valves are still closed because it's still early in ventricular systole. In fact, those semilunar valves won't even open until ventricular pressure exceeds aortic pressure or pulmonary pressure, right? So this gray line here is showing aortic pressure. So once ventricular pressure exceeds aortic pressure, the semilunar valves swing open. And when those semilunar valves open, ventricular volume decreases dramatically because this is the ejection phase where blood's being ejected out of the ventricles into the aorta and pulmonary trunk. This continues as pressure rises, and we can see that aortic pressure rises too. Um, and then what we find is on the EKG, we get the T wave here. Remember, the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Action potentials are starting to go away here, and um, then that we should expect then the, the ventricular myocardium should also start to relax. So uh, if we look up here then, as the ventricular myocardium relaxes, ventricular pressure starts to fall. And when ventricular pressure gets lower than aortic pressure, the aortic semilunar valve also closes. Now this is true of the pulmonary semilunar valve too, because both the semilunar valves close simultaneously. So when ventricular pressure gets lower than aortic or pulmonary pressure, that causes these semilunar valves to close, including the aortic valve, and that correlates with S2. So S2 or dub, <coughs> the second heart sound, is due to the closure of those semilunar valves when ventricular pressure gets lower than aortic pressure. In fact, there's so much aortic pressure that occurs when those valves close, it causes this little notch here called the dichrotic notch. It's basically a wave of pressure that's propagated out throughout your arteries due to the closure of the aortic semilunar valve. You can measure this, which is pretty cool. Now, um, after this T wave, you know, we, we, end up, we enter a phase where there's not a whole lot of electrical activity going on here, right? So if there's no electrical activity in this period of time, we should also expect then that there's no mechanical activities really going on either. That's true, but not true. Now, it's, it's true that there are no um, contractions, like the atria aren't contracting and the ventricles aren't contracting because there's no electrical activity here, right? But what we do find is that when ventricular pressure continues to fall and it continually relaxes, once that ventricular pressure gets below atrial pressure, the AV valves open. When those AV valves open, then blood starts to spill into the ventricles. And when I say spill, I mean it's passive. It's not being pumped in, it's passively filling. And so then we can see that ventricular volume decrease, I'm sorry, increases dramatically, right? This is the 80% of ventricular filling that's passive filling. Once ventricular pressure gets lower than atrial pressure, that AV valve opens up and then blood starts spilling into the ventricle, right? And then if we look where we are now, here's the P wave again. So we just went in full, one full cardiac cycle. So you can see from P wave to P wave, all of this is one cardiac cycle. So the distance between one heartbeat. So we went through all those events here. Um, one thing I forgot to mention though is this third heart sound is actually due to, you can hear it sometimes, and it's due to the filling of blood in the ventricles. It's not always that prominent, but sometimes you can hear it when the ventricles are filling with blood, it creates a sloshing noise, which can sound like a third heart sound, like there's a love dub and then it's another kind of whooshing noise, which is the third heart sound. Okay? So this really just ties it all together. If you can explain this, then you know you know the cardiac cycle. So I would highly recommend going through this and figuring it out, trying to, try to talk about each of those different traces. Okay. Now, um, one thing that's important to know, you guys, is this, this idea of cardiac output. And this is extremely important to talk about now because this is foundational for next week. So what we'll notice here is that these slides will take us into what we'll talk about next week on blood pressure regulation. So how do we regulate blood pressure in the body? Well, we know that in part it's mediated by the heart. Like your heart definitely plays a role in, in maintaining blood pressure because it's pumping out blood, right? In fact, cardiac output, or CO, represents the amount of blood that's pumped out of your heart in one minute. So cardiac output is the volume of blood that's pumped out of your heart in every minute. The equation for this is stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's pumped into your heart in every beat. Heart rate is beats per minute. Well, um, beats cancel out, and then what you end up with is blood per minute. So that's cardiac output. So cardiac output here then at rest can be close or more than five liters. And we know that five liters can, is, is about your average blood volume. So it means that at rest, your heart can pump your entire blood volume in one minute. Okay? So 
Um, maximal cardiac output, you guys, is four to five times resting cardiac output. So what this means is, is uh, you, could, you could pump as much as 30 liters of blood during exercise in one minute. You know, if you have a two liter bottle of soda, you can pump, your heart can pump out 15 of those in a minute while, at, while you're exercising. Not at rest, while you're exercising, which is a tremendous amount of blood. Now, um, so maximal cardiac output can, can be as high as 35 liters in trained athletes. Now, we talk about cardiac reserve as being the difference between resting and maximal cardiac output. And this gives us an idea of how adaptable our heart is. Like, how well can the heart respond to stress during exercise? <clears throat> and if your cardiac reserve is low, that means your heart can't adapt very well to exercise. If your cardiac reserve is high, that means it can adapt to exercise pretty well, and it's a, it's a more healthy kind of heart, if that makes sense. So how do we define cardiac output again, you guys? Well, like, just as a, in words. Good. The amount of blood your heart pumps out in one minute. What's our equation for cardiac output? Heart rate times stroke volume. And I got, I'll tell you what, guys. There's another way to calculate stroke volume. It's end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. Remember, end diastolic volume was the amount of blood your heart, I'm sorry, the amount of blood that fills your heart before it contracts. End systolic volume is the amount of blood that's left behind after it contracts. So if you know how much came in and you know how much is left behind, then you, then you know how much actually left because it's the difference between the two, right? If end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that filled the ventricle and systolic volume is the little bit that remains, then, then you know the difference is what left the ventricle. That's stroke volume, okay? So if you can take stroke volume, which is the amount of blood ejected from your heart in one beat, multiply that beat times beats per minute, well, the beats cancel out and you end up with volume of blood per minute. That's cardiac output. Now, it turns out that cardiac output and blood pressure are proportional. So if you can increase cardiac output, you can increase blood pressure. If you get decreases in cardiac output, you can decrease blood pressure. So what if someone's heart rate is slow? What might happen to their blood pressure? It could decrease, right? If their heart rate decreases, that could decrease cardiac output, which could decrease blood pressure. But what if they had a slow heart rate but high stroke volume? Which means they could get the same amount of cardiac output even with fewer beats if their stroke volume is really high. And you see this in trained athletes where they might have a resting heart rate like in the 40s. And they can maintain that because their stroke volume is so large, they can get the same amount of cardiac output in less beats, which is pretty cool. Now, uh, stroke volume here, you guys, we said was end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. EDV, or end diastolic volume, was the amount that fills your ventricles at the end of diastole, right before they contract. And ESV is end systolic volume. That's the amount of blood that remains in your ventricles after they contract. So if you take the difference between the two, then you know how much left, right? Usually I use the example of like a cookie jar. Like, you know, you got like 10 cookies in the jar. You leave, go to school, come home. There's only two left, right? How many cookies that were the, that left your jar? Eight. Eight, exactly. That's like stroke volume. You know, if you do, you got 10 cookies that fill your ventricles. And you only have two left behind after the ventricles contract. That means you know that eight left your ventricle. That's stroke volume. Mmm, cookies. <laughs> now, there are three main factors that affect stroke volume, guys. You know, you might wonder, how can you change the amount of blood that you pump out of your heart in every beat? Well, it relates to preload, which is the amount of stretch on your ventricle, contractility, which is how strongly your ventricular muscle contract, and afterload, which is basically diastolic pressure, or the pressure that your ventricles need to overcome in order to eject blood out of the heart. Because we learned about earlier how... <laughs> the semilunar valves remain closed even when the ventricles are contracting early on because there's diastolic pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunk. If you can't generate enough pressure to open up the semilunar valves, then the blood's never going to leave, right? So afterload is the amount of diastolic pressure your ventricles have to overcome to get those semilunar valves open in order to eject that blood out of the heart. If you can't open those, then you're going to have affected stroke volume. So what might uh, increase stroke volume? Do you guys think it would be like a higher afterload or a lower afterload? Lower. Yeah, lower, right? If your diastolic pressure were lower, then it's easier to open those semilunar valves, which means it's easier, if you have more time to eject that blood, so your stroke volume is higher, right? What if someone's diastolic pressure was extremely high? Harder to open those semilunar valves, which means your ejection phase is shorter, which means your stroke volume is probably less, which means your cardiac output is probably 
less, which means your blood pressure could be lower. Nice. Good job, you guys. <laughs> That's an awesome job. Um, so preload is the degree of stretch, you guys. And now there's an interesting phenomenon here where if cardiac muscle is more stretched, it'll contract more strongly. And it's, we call this the Frank Starling law um, of cardiac muscle contraction. So you might wonder, how, do your, how does your cardiac muscle become more stretched? Like, how do you get more blood to fill your ventricles? More, you want more blood to fill the ventricles, but where's that blood coming from? Atria. Atria. So what might increase your preload here? Atrial consistently. Yeah, good. How strong your atria contract? But what does most ventricular filling come from? Passive, right? But where's that blood coming from that's filling the ventricles? Atria, but it comes from veins. So how could you increase your preload then with respect to venous blood? Yeah, if you can increase your venous return to your heart, like have more venous blood come back to your heart, then you can actually fill your ventricles more. If your ventricles fill more, they're stretched more, which means they have more preload. And the relationship between preload and contractility is that if they're more stretched, they will contract more strongly. And if your ventricles are more stretched and they contract more strongly, what's that going to do to stroke volume? Increase it. You got it, you guys. In fact, that's what this next slide is showing right here. How if you can increase your ventricular and diastolic volume, it correspondingly increases stroke volume. So if you can increase venous return during exercise, then you can increase your stroke volume, which increases your cardiac output. But to a point, do you guys see there's a maximal level here and it starts yeah. to taper off? There's a point at which your ventricular muscle, if it overstretches, it leads to diminishing returns. Like you actually can't contract as strongly. And there's a length tension relationship here. When the muscle's stretched, it can contract more strongly, but not if it's overstretched. If it's overstretched because your end diastolic volume is so high, then you get less contraction, which means you have a smaller stroke volume. Now, um, contractility refers to just the strength of contraction, and it correlates with EDV, right? So how do we get a stronger contract contractility with respect to end diastolic volume? Like, would you want to increase or decrease end diastolic volume to make heart muscle contract more strongly? Increase. increase it, which is what this slide was, right? So if you increase your ventricular end diastolic volume, you increase your stroke volume. That's the relationship there, right? Now, there are other things that can also increase contractility, things like sympathetic nervous system stimulation. We knew that because if your sympathetic nervous system stimulates the heart, it not only increases heart rate, but it also increases contractility. Does the parasympathetic nervous system affect contractility? No, no, no. not really. So mostly just the sympathetic nervous system. It's also affected by positive inotropic agents. Positive inotropic agents are things that make heart muscle contract more strongly. Things like thyroxin, which is T3. You guys learned about this earlier, right? Um, glucagon, right? Epinephrine, digitalis, which is actually a drug from a plant called foxglove. You ever seen this before? Um, there's a fox glove, foxglove flower. It's kind of a uh, tall, straight, has these little sort of bell-shaped flowers that hang off. There's a toxin in foxglove called digitoxin. And what we've done is we've isolated that toxin from the plant, put it in a, in a pill form, digitalis, and you can take this for heart failure. If someone's heart's failing, why would you want to give them a positive inotropic agent? Yes, good. You increase heart muscle contractility, which increases stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, and that, that way they don't die. Good. And what's cool is that people have been using digitalis for thousands of years. It wasn't called digitalis. They just got it from the, the flower, right? Now we can isolate it and standardize its concentration so you can give someone a known dosage. The issue with just like taking a random plant is that you can't standardize for dose. So what, you know, if it's, if it's more, like one plant might have a more potent form, other plant might have less. And so if you can isolate it, then you can actually kind of standardize how much you're giving to somebody and not just give them like, you know, varying amounts, if that makes sense. Um, but one thing we've learned though, is if you isolate chemicals from plants, they don't always work the same way. So in fact, someone, there's a group recently that won the Nobel Prize because they learned that if you don't heat up this plant to extract its chemicals and just do a cold extraction, the chemical doesn't denature, and you're actually able to get this drug in its most potent, potent form. And this is a new malarial drug that could like help eradicate malaria, which is actually pretty awesome. I know. So these guys just won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, and that comes from traditional Chinese medicine. So there's a lot to be learned there. Um, high extracellular calcium also makes your, high, your um, 
your heart muscle contract more strongly. But heart muscle contractility is also decreased by negative inotropic agents like acidosis, high, high potassium levels, or even calcium channel blockers. Why would you want to give someone a calcium channel blocker to decrease the contractility of their heart muscle? Because that would help them from hypertension and tachycardia. Yeah, good. If someone had like hypertension or high blood pressure, you put them on a calcium channel blocker, their heart muscle doesn't contract as strongly, they have less stroke volume, less cardiac output, lower blood pressure. Pretty cool. So this will all come back into play, you guys, for our next chapter because it's a, it's a big old process of blood pressure regulation. It doesn't only involve your heart. So that's next week. Now, after load, we talked about as the pressure your ventricles have to overcome to eject blood, right? This was equivalent to saying like systolic or diastolic pressure after load? Diastolic. diastolic pressure, right? It's the residual pressure. And so if your after load is too high, then it could be difficult for your ventricles to generate enough pressure to open up those semilunar valves. So that you want after load to be low, like you want your diastolic pressure to be lower, you know, to a point, but not too low but low enough so it's easy enough for your semilunar valves to swing open to begin the ejection phase. If you have longer period of time for your ejection phase to occur, you're going to get more blood that leaves the heart, which means you have a greater stroke volume, which means you have a greater cardiac output and potentially even higher blood pressure. So um, you want to minimize afterload. In fact, one of, the, one of the major determinants of cardiovascular disease, you guys, is not systolic pressure. It's diastolic pressure. It's worse to have a higher diastolic pressure than it is a systolic pressure. Like, let's say, let's say someone had 150 over 80. That's not as bad as if someone had 150 over 140. Because that higher diastolic pressure makes it much more difficult for your heart to have to overcome to even eject blood. That puts extra stress on the heart, which is associated with poorer outcomes. So one of the major determinants of cardiovascular disease is the diastolic pressure, not the systolic pressure. I mean, systolic pressure plays a role, obviously. But, um, you know, in terms of looking at the data... It, it tells us that people with a higher diastolic pressure have poorer outcomes. So it's kind of interesting. Now, uh, there are some reflexes that occur in the heart too, you guys, like the atrial bane bridge reflex. This occurs when the atrium stretch to the increased venous return. And due to atrial stretch, the heart beats more, more quickly. And that makes sense because if the atria is stretching, that means you have increased venous return. And if this causes your heart rate to increase, then you can get, keep up with that venous return and increase cardiac output. So that's that atrial or bane bridge reflex. And so you can see this during exercise. There's also another really cool one, you guys, the mammalian dive reflex. This is where in mammals, including humans, because we're mammals, if you get water on the face, like cold water, there's a reflex here. It causes your heart rate to slow down. Now you guys know why, like in those like old school movies, why like if people are all scared or you know flustered, they start splashing water on their face, right? Because they're initiating a mammalian dive reflex, which causes their heart rate to slow down. But let's think about this. What the heck? Mammalian dive reflex. Well, if your face is wet, that simulates what it would be like to be underwater or diving, right? And if you're diving, you're not breathing. So if you're not breathing, do you want a really fast heart rate? No, because no, you're going to run out of oxygen fast. So it's a really interesting phenomenon in mammals, including humans, that uh, where you actually heart rate slows down after you dive in water. But you can simulate this by splashing water in your face. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> I would love to test it sometimes. If you can measure blood pressure or heart rate and just like start splashing water on each other's faces. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> um, there are different hormones that can affect heart rate, you guys. Things like epinephrine, we know it increases heart rate. Thyroxin also increases heart rate. Um, and it actually enhances the effects of epinephrine. In fact, if you have thyroxin, epinephrine, and glucagon together, that gives you the biggest increase in heart rate. Yeah, they're all related to, to metabolism, right? Yeah. So epinephrine is sympathetic. Thyroxine meta is metabolism. Glucagon increases blood sugar. And it makes sense that all of these things would increase your heart rate. So it's pretty cool. Um, what's also, what can also affect heart function, you guys, is also, um, uh, electrolyte balances, too. Things like calcium and potassium. So uh, hypocalcemia means low blood um, calcium. sorry, And this can depress your heart rate. Hypercalcemia means high blood calcium. This can lead to an increase in heart rate and contractility. Hyperkalemia. Kalemia means, I know it sounds like Khaleesi, like Game of Thrones, but kalemia. <laughs> uh, hyperkalemia. You guys probably watched that. You're like, what the hell is he talking about? Oh, you do? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> hyperkalemia is a high blood potassium, and this can alter electrical activity and can lead to like heart block and cardiac arrest. 
or hypokalemia means low blood potassium. This can lead to things like feeble heart and arrhythmias. In fact, um, many like anorexics die from hypokalemia. Like they don't eat enough to, to support their own body's potassium. They lose so much potassium, it ends up causing fatal arrhythmias. Like I think Karen Carpenter died this way. So it's interesting. Um, and then congestive heart failure, guys, just to really like make this understandable. Congestive heart failure is when your heart fails to adequately supply your body's tissues with enough oxygen to meet those needs. So congestive heart failure would be if your cardiac output is too low to adequately supply your body's tissues with their metabolic needs. That's congestive heart failure. Now the congestive part comes from the fact that blood can back up in a particular area, right? Like if the right side of the heart's failing, then blood's gonna back up in systemic veins. If the left side of the heart's failing, then blood's gonna back up in the lungs. And that's when you see those different congestions. Now there are different sequelae consequences, things like high blood pressure, myocardial infarction, or basically death of the myocardium, or even dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart muscle becomes weakened over time. Now pulmonary congestion is due to left side of heart failure, peripheral congestion is due to right side of heart failure, and that makes sense because the left side of the heart receives blood from the lungs. If it's not adequately pumping blood along, then blood's going to back up in the lungs. That, that's what we call pulmonary congestion. If the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs but also receives blood from the rest of the body, and if the right side of the heart can't adequately keep blood moving, then blood's going to back up in the rest of the body. We call it systemic congestion. Systemic congestion leads to things like edema, especially in the extremities like the legs. So someone with the right side of heart failure can have really large legs, not due to adipose, but due to, due to venous blood buildup and fluid buildup because their right side of the heart can't keep up with proper blood flow. So uh, failure of one side leads to the left, you guys, because they're so highly interconnected. And this is treated by removing fluid, reducing afterload, 